but also helping you to give structure to, to what you write as well, I think. Oh, sorry. Uh, hang on. All right, let's go to self versus nature. This is one of the most common ones. And sometimes it sounds funny to people because it's like, oh, how are you fighting Mother Nature? But it's not quite like that. It's it's the idea of, um, you know, there are forces in nature that are so strong that uh, they're dangerous, right? Like uh, things like natural disasters, like floods, droughts, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, blizzards, earthquakes, landslides famines, heat waves, those kind of things where you have no no control over it and yet it can, you know, destroy your property, destroy your home, destroy your business. Um, it would also include situations where the environment can be deadly if the person is not prepared with the tools or know-how to survive. So like if you were suddenly dropped off in a desert without water, all of a sudden you're in a deadly situation or extreme cold or snow or in a jungle or a rainforest or on a mountaintop or in the wilderness, places where the environment itself um, has such extremes of cold or heat or um, animals or whatever, that survival is, is a key part of, of being there. And if you're not prepared, then it can be deadly. Okay, self versus nature would also include fights against animals like if you've ever read uh stephen king's cujo that would be an excellent example of this that's a, a a whole uh book on a man and he's trying to get his young daughter out of a car it's a hot day and then she's in the car and it's too hot and she's burning up but he can't get past this horrible dog to get his daughter to safety and it sounds crazy that you could write an entire book about it but it's a gripping book if you get a chance to read it right and that's the idea of self versus nature as well. So some common examples might be um, wolves, bears, lions, coyotes, hyenas, dogs, um, snakes, alligators, crocodiles, insects, rodents, even poisonous plants could count, right? There are plants that can kill you. All right. Self versus society. So any situation where the main issue is the response of society to what the person wants, whether what they want is right or wrong or good or bad or whatever. A person might face humiliation, exclusion, uh, firing, imprisonment, or even death, depending on the society and the severity of its disapproval for the actions. Um, any situation in which what the person wants is opposed by society. Sometimes the opposal may be like an actual law against it, or it may just be, um, uh, like we often talk about cancel culture these days, where it's not necessarily against the law, but people kind of turn your, their backs on you if you're doing this sort of thing. So what the person wants could be good, bad, or even morally neutral, but it could still be something that the society disapproves of. And what that could be changes according to like the time. Like what what would be disapproved of now might be, is well, obviously is quite different than what we might be disapproved of 500 years ago um, or what's disapproved of in Canada might be different than what's disapproved of over in um, in India or in Russia or in France, right? Different societies have different um, unspoken and rules and, and different laws. So sometimes you could be breaking class rules by dating someone out of their class or by doing work out of their class. That can be a huge issue in some countries. Dating and marrying across races has sometimes been disapproved of, right? Uh, breaking out of gender roles, where society doesn't feel like the job that you want to do is men's work or women's work or whatever. Um, it can be negative things, where what the person wants to do is actually not good for them, and society is trying to influence the person to do good. So, for example, a man wants to abandon his wife and kids to run away, but he doesn't because the social cost is too high and he doesn't want to risk that. Or a politician who doesn't really care about people, but he advocates for them because the career cost would be too high if he didn't. 
or the kid who wants to do drugs, but he doesn't due to social expectations around him. I'm sorry, I keep thinking I've gotten that solved and then it goes off again. Got that completely turned off now, hopefully. All right, self versus technology. Um, this is like a Terminator picture here. Uh, self versus technology is a newer category, right? You're not going to read about that much in older um, older books. Um, it could involve situations where machines or robots have taken over the world from humans, such as the Terminator movies or something like The Matrix. It can also be more subtle versions of this, like a computer virus that has knocked out all the technology at a hospital or like self-driving cars that get hacked or driven off a cliff or something. It could also be things like a bad guy is being thwarted by new technological safeguards at a bank or spies being discovered by tracking devices and bugs on their phone. So it could be a positive thing or a negative thing. Person versus person. This is probably the most common type of conflict. And it can be like one individual versus another individual or a group of people versus a different group of people. So on the person versus person, it could be like two guys trying to compete for the same girl, two actresses trying to win the part in a pivotal movie, two businessmen trying to fight for the most profit in their industry, two athletes competing for the same spot on a sports team, two politicians, trying to get elected as prime minister, two lawyers arguing a case in a courtroom, or it could be person versus person, groups, people like Russia versus Ukraine in the war, um, Burger King versus McDonald's, uh, Detroit Red Wings versus the Montreal Canadiens, big oil companies versus environmental activists, uh, two construction companies trying to win a bid. Um, also, many participants against each other, like it's been like the Hunger Games, but there's a lot of people involved and it's sort of a, a free for all until one person comes up on top. Squid Game, I think was the other one that was like that, right? Uh, self versus fate. It's a tricky one. I don't know if people really think about fate um, as much today as this is a huge concept in older days. The idea that um, each person, or at least some things like very famous people or, or powerful people have a a fate that they cannot escape no matter how much they try. Um, in ancient writings, it's often accompanied by oracles or prophecies that the character tries to thwart. It was a really common theme in the time travel show Timeless, where the crew battled to save history, but sometimes struggled with what that meant. So for example, there was one episode where they were, um, the bad guys were gonna make sure that Abraham Lincoln was killed at the time that he was supposed to and the crew was struggling with well should we try and save him after all right and they actually do end up trying to save him but he dies anyway and the conclusion they kind of come to is that he was fated to die in other words the world or the gods or whatever meant for him to die at that time so uh terminator same kind of thing the the lady sarah she's fated to give birth to the son who will help the future humans fight the machines so the machines send back killers to try and destroy her and actually start into motion her fate because now long before they ever existed, this person knows about them and trains her son to fight them, right? So the idea of fate is like, no matter what you do, all your efforts to escape a certain end are going to be uh, thwarted and will actually create the fate you're trying to escape. So here is an example from The Matrix. I'm hoping Matrix is a big enough movie that everybody's seen it. Um, hang on a sec. Almost done. Can I get it? I don't know if I can make it bigger. Hang on a second, guys. Uh, Almost done. Yeah. I'd ask you to sit down, but you're not going to anyway. 
and don't worry about the vase. What vase? That vase. I'm sorry. I said don't worry about it. I'll get one of my kids to fix it. How did you know? Oh, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is, would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? You're cuter than I thought. I can see why she likes you. Who? Not too bright, though. You know why Morpheus brought you to see me. So, what do you think? Do you think you are the one? Honestly, I don't know. You know what that means? It's Latin. It means know thyself. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love. You just know it through and through, balls to bones. Well, I better have a look at you. Open your mouth, say ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Okay. Now I'm supposed to say, hmm, that's interesting, but then you say. But what? But you already know what I'm going to tell. I'm not the one. Sorry, kid. You got the gift. But it looks like you're waiting for something. What? Your next life, maybe. Who knows? That's the way these things go. What's funny? Morpheus. He, uh... He almost had me convinced. I know. Poor Morpheus. Without him, we're lost. What do you mean? I'm going to pause that now. So the idea here is she's the oracle and he's been brought there to read his future. And she says he's not the one, although later on he turns out to be the one. So there's some question of that. But it's a, an old concept, but it does come up for sure. Uh, self versus supernatural being this one comes up in all sorts of uh, uh, time frames right from the olden days to now uh, if you look here this is a picture of Buffy the Vampire Slayer fighting a monster right this is often the main conflict in many horror shows or fantasy movies like the self versus a ghost or self versus a haunted house or versus a monster or vampire or a werewolf, or a wizard, or a witch. One of the main common threads is that the fight, the opponent has magical or mysterious powers that the main character doesn't have access to. So it's kind of an unfair fight from the beginning. And sometimes they must use intelligence or goodness or teamwork to try and overcome the supernatural being. Other times the main character secretly has magical powers of their own, that only emerge under the pressure of the conflict with this being, such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So in your life, you're gonna brainstorm possible conflicts to write about. Uh, remember, it's gonna need to be a page long, so you want it to be a big enough conflict that you can write for a page about it. So some possible areas to look at, an important conflict with your boss or your coworker, a conflict with a bully or an attacker of some sort, overcoming an addiction of some sort, uh, a fight to become the person you want to be compared to what society wants you to be. Maybe a fight to leave a gang and become your own person or a conflict with an authority figure of some sort. Um, a fight against racism or sexism. A time you survived a conflict with nature, an animal or natural disaster such as a fire or exposure to the elements. 
a competition of some sorts, like an athletic competition or a theater tryout, singing, dancing, writing, a political competition, like fighting to become um, a chief or a counselor or a trustee or something, um, a pro tent. <laughs> such as those involved in a social justice issue. Once you have a possible topic picked out, you need to start thinking about the possible details, right? There's information that you wanna come across in the very first paragraph. You wanna establish the setting. Where are you in the story and how long ago was it, right? Is it's been happening now or did it happen to you 50 years ago, right? Characters, you wanna get across a little bit of who you are or who you were in the story. Are you a shy teenager, a feisty lady in your 30s, a confident athlete, an unhappy gambler? Are you by yourself in the story, which might happen if it's a self by self, self versus self conflict, or are there other people involved? You don't need to describe everybody in the story, but we should be able to visualize the main characters that you're in conflict with. So if there's a, if the entire story is about you trying to um, become deputy chief against a certain opponent, then we would want to have a picture of the opponent in our, high, our minds too, okay? And try at the beginning to convey a little bit of how the problem is starting or what it is about to happen. You don't want to wait too long because it is only a page. And the meaty middle, middle. Most of your page is going to be the middle. Just look in our paragraphs, right? Where there's one sentence to open and one sentence to end. Here, you're gonna have like an introductory kind of um, paragraph we just talked about, but most of your story is gonna be the middle part. This is where the conflict begins to unfold, where you describe how you attempted to solve the problem. Remember that you're writing in a story or a narrative format. So you don't wanna treat this like a question and answer type of writing. You wouldn't say, I tried to solve my problem by. Instead, you would describe the dialogue between the characters. And in this case, you're treating yourself like a character, right? Which is kind of hard sometimes, I know. Um, the actions you took and what they took in response. Generally, in most stories, the tension or the conflict gets bigger and more exciting as time goes on until the problem is solved. At the end, the problem usually gets solved. Now, it's not usually like the last sentence, okay? Um, it should be the most exciting part of the story. You want to try and save some great description or some amazing dialogue for this part. But then after that problem is solved, there's usually a little bit of like wrapping up the loose endings and helping the reader feel satisfied with the overall results. So here's some example of what I mean, like, the climax of the high point might be the hero finally beats the villain in a glorious sword fight, which I know isn't going to happen in our, our thing, but just to give you an example, right? And the wrap up, the villain is dragged off and thrown into the dungeon, wrong throne, while the hero is rewarded by the king for their bravery. Wow. I don't know if I did that one or if that was a auto correct there. Okay. Uh, another one, Climax. Hero gets the star role in the movie she was trying out for through a phone call while she's at her parents' house who told her she would never make it. Parents are amazed and embarrassed. Wrap up, dad drops her off at the stage for her first day of filming and tells her how proud she he is of her. Okay, so I'm going to kind of demo what this would look like, right? So I did a little bit of brainstorming of my beginning. Um, setting is a metal shop class in high school in the 80s. Character is me. A bully, we're going to call him Ned. Tall, huge, older, very tough, feared by all. Bullied, we're going to call him Zach. Tiny, scrawny, shy, and unconfident. Unsure how to handle the bullying except by ignoring it. The rest of the class, mixture of boys. Some joining in on the bullying, others not, but not helping either. Also, obviously, don't use people's real names here because you don't want to embarrass other people and I don't need to know, you know, who you've been in conflict with. Um, beginning of the problem. Uh, the teacher often arrives late to start class in another room. Lots of free time with no supervision, which allowed a lot of 
uh, bullying to occur on a daily basis of this one particular kid. Um, I'm involved because I'm also feeling threatened and angry by the bullying, but afraid that if I speak up, it's going to turn on me and I don't really want to be one girl versus 20 boys. What I wish I had done or should have done told the teacher or the office. What I actually did was I stayed quiet, kept my head down, felt scared and mad. Teamed up with the kid as a partner, both because no one wanted to work with a girl and try and be a friend to him. And then it escalated to the lathe machine incident, which I'll talk about later. Um, describe in detail. It's important to use dialogue here. Lots of description. So the middle will include multiple paragraphs, right? Three or four would be pretty common for one page. Uh, as I was outlining, I was realizing that there was actually multiple types of conflict here, which is not surprising, right? There's character versus character, the guy bullying the victim. There's self versus self, my desire for safety versus my desire to do the right thing. And then self versus society, struggling against taboos against girls fighting, and also just fighting in school. And also my family is stressing the importance of being good at school. Now, this is all just part of my brainstorm. I'm just kind of thinking about things here, basically. And then the high point, uh, I get my courage up, tell the bully to leave my friend alone. Bully threatens to fight me, but backs down. Friend and I get to work on the machine and people settle down. Wrap up to the ending, walk into class the next day, talking to the friend. So I will probably do some more brainstorming if I get to a tricky part, but this rough outline will get me started on a rough draft. I want to make the first paragraph interesting and something people will want to read. Remember that we use paragraphs to chunk the information into smaller bits for readers to help them understand the story better. Just like we use uh, sentences to make the information a little bit more understandable. We don't need to use the opening and closing topic sentences that we've worked on with other types of writing because this is one continuous narrative. Because this happened in high school, and that part is pretty critical to the story. Like I would handle things much differently now if I was like, um, well, just as an adult, but also like in my own home or even at work compared to how I would handle things in high school, right? I'm gonna make that setting really clear for the first part of the paragraph because I want to establish that right away for the audience. Something to keep in mind, if the setting is really important, like if, if you're in like self versus nature and it's because you're outside in the cold, you want to make sure that's super clear to your audience right away. So here's an example. And then I kind of show you on the side where I'm getting the all those main points. And I've said before, one of my flaws is I tend to write long and I apologize. Uh, it actually takes me longer to shorten it out, which is what I would do in my revision, right? This is just my rough draft. So I start with, I was kind of a strange kid in high school. I was off and off by myself, and for the most part, I preferred it that way. All the other girls were wearing the neon pink, yellow, and lime green tops that were popular in the 80s. I'm pretty sure I was mostly wearing flannel shirts and jeans. I was taking a lot of tech courses the year I was in grade 10, and I didn't want to stand out too badly. That was hard because I was the only girl in my metal shop class, and so it was pretty hard to blend in. I was pretty shy at that point. So I sat at the back of the class and I didn't talk much to any anyone. So I'm trying to set up the setting and the main character. Uh, the class was a bit strange too. I don't know what was up with the teacher, but he was always late. That left a room full of 15 year old boys with nothing to do while they waited. They managed to pass the time the way boys that age will always do, making jokes with each other, talking about girls and what they did on the weekend. Most of the boys seemed decent but there were two that just gave me bad vibes right away. I don't remember their real names, but let's call them Ned and Corey. So here I'm kind of sketching out the setting and the background and introducing the new characters, right? Ned was without a doubt the tallest kid in the class and possibly the school. He was easily two feet taller than most of the boys. Looking back, I think he might've been a lot older than the rest of us and maybe felt a bit self-conscious about it. He had messy dark hair and a five o'clock shadow. I did my best to seem invisible whenever I saw him. Corey was more or less his sidekick. He was almost the complete opposite. Corey had long, slick, shining blonde hair. He was small and wiry with a quick mouth for jokes and insults. Within a few weeks, the early class boredom took a turn for the worst as they began to figure out who might make the best target 
for the kind of humiliation they love to give. So here I'm trying to introduce, here's what the problem is, right? Um, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to kind of skip down, make sure I got everything here. Um, hang on a sec. Okay. I'm going to go back to, they mentioned the part about descriptive uh, details. So one way to add a description to your story is adjectives and adverbs, right? We've done that. So here I just kind of grabbed some sentences and thought about how I wanted to add some details. The highway, the hallways were huge, full of teenagers heading back and forth in a chaotic race to get to their classes before the five minute transport time was over. Um, another one was I dressed to hide my long brown hair hung loose around my face and I wore very little makeup. I felt invisible as I walked slowly down that busy hallway. The teacher was ancient and oblivious. He had long since forgotten how teenage boys were capable of treating each other. I have no idea what he did in that back room. It had a large window so he could look out and see us, but he never did look out at the class. So those are just some examples of uh, sentences that are full of adjectives and adverbs that I can add into my story. You could also use comparisons, okay? Comparisons can be very powerful when you're writing. One type of comparison is to use similes. Similes compare two or more things using the words like or as. Sometimes these comparisons become so overused that they become cliches, like he felt as cold as ice. The car was fast like a rocket. I could compare the boy's laughter to wolves howling to get across the idea that the boys are acting like predators. For example, the boy's howls of laughter echoed like the sound of wolves baying at their prey. Zach was like a rabbit, frozen, hoping the fox won't notice him if he just stays still. Metaphors are another way to make a comparison. When you use a metaphor, you don't use the words like or as. You just say that that one thing is another thing or was, whatever verb is there, is, was, were. Um, the reader has to kind of understand that it's not literal, that it's poetic, okay? Some examples might be, he is the rock in our family. The school is a light in our community. Drugs were a disease that made people sick and weak. So the idea here is you're comparing it by making an analogy, right? Um, and that can be a really powerful way because like people understand what a rock is, right? You don't need to describe every single thing about your person's character when you say that. Um, drugs are a disease. People understand what the idea of a disease is. It's just a, a a powerful and easy way to make comparisons. Okay. Once you're finished your rough draft, don't forget you're gonna have to go back and revise. Don't forget the other steps of revision. Um, ARMS is our acronym, right? Add, you can add adjectives, adverbs, details, sentences and paragraphs. You can remove repetitive phrases, overused words, confusing sentences. You can move things, rearrange phrases, sentences, and paragraphs to make it clearer or flow better. You can substitute more interesting words for vague or weak nouns, um, verbs, adjectives, or ad adverbs, sorry. Okay, so here's a quick example. Here is my rough draft from what I just basically read, so I'm not gonna read it again, right? And I redid it, trying to add more description of the setting and of the characters to set it up a little bit better, right? A lot of the sentences are the same, but I did make some changes so you can kind of see what I mean, right? I was not a brave kid in high school. I dressed to hide. My long brown hair hung loose around my face and I wore very little makeup. I wore faded jeans and a lot of gray flannel shirts and t-shirts and sweatshirts. I felt invisible as I walked slowly down those busy hallways. They were always full of teenagers heading back and forth in a chaotic race to get to their classes before the five minutes transport time was over. The girls were mostly dressed in neon pink and yellow and lime green, 
the typical 80, 80s colors. I was taking a lot of tech courses that year, and I didn't want to stand out too badly, since I was the only girl in my metal shop class that was pretty much impossible. I did the best I could by sitting at the back of the classroom and trying not to talk to anybody. So I haven't added a lot of details, but I think that's a little bit clearer. So when you're revising, think about that. It's like when you first wrote, you kind of did a rough um, color sketch in a sense. And then as you go back and revise, you're making some colors stronger. You're doing some outlining. Maybe you're adding a few details, right? It's just that you're making the entire thing a little bit stronger, basically. Okay. I am running short on time, so I'm going to have to wrap up here. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoy this assignment. It's kind of fun to think about your life as if it were a story. I think it is. Um, and I will talk to you guys again tomorrow.